pranams and loving greetings. It is a deep joy to be with all of you as we come together to immerse ourselves in the sacred teachings of our revered Guru, Paramahansa Yoganandaji. So again, a very warm welcome to all of you. My name is Sister Draupadi, and our talk today is Devotion Relating to God from the Heart. And while devotion is a very beautiful subject, I think we would all agree that to offer our devotion to God is a very intimate and personal experience for each one of us, no matter what spiritual tradition we follow. And of course, there are those sacred practices that we can apply that will help us deepen our relationship with God. And we are very blessed to have a very complete and beautiful path to help us toward this end. And because we're all very unique, the great masters of yoga have designed various yogic approaches to suit our individual temperaments. And in Self-Realization Fellowship, we follow the path of Raja Yoga, the royal path that encompasses all of the yogas. So for example, we have karma yoga, and that is when we render selfless service to God and to the God in others, renouncing all desire for recognition or for reward. And when we live this way, when we act this way, it purifies the heart and consciousness and draws us ever closer to God. And then there is jnana yoga, and that is when we weigh every decision, every choice, every motive to ensure that it aligns with dharma, with moral and spiritual righteousness. And then every wise choice purifies the consciousness and draws us ever closer to pure divine consciousness. And when we practice the sacred science of Kriya Yoga meditation to still the restless mind and calm the tumultuous emotions, we are practicing the greatest techniques of pranayama in Raja Yoga to uplift and interiorize the consciousness and to realize our oneness with pure divine consciousness. But there is one yoga, one quality, that gives power to all the other yogas, and that is bhakti yoga. The yoga of pure devotion, complete surrender, and, to, and supreme love for the Lord. So why is bhakti yoga so essential, so vital? because devotion is the secret ingredient to success on the spiritual path. Without devotion and love for God, he escapes us. If we want to realize that divine one hidden within us, we have to love him. Guruji refers to God in so many different poetic terms and one of my favorites is when he refers to God as the searcher of hearts, because that's what God does. He searches our hearts. And Guruji says, the searcher of hearts wants only your sincere love. He's like a little child. Someone may offer him his whole wealth, and he doesn't want it. And another cries to him, Oh, Lord, I love you. Into that devastee's heart, he comes running. So beautiful. And this is why many bhaktas, the great saints and masters of all traditions, tell us that when we offer to God the love and devotion of our hearts, we melt his heart. And this grants us entry into his infinite bosom of love and joy. And who of us 
wouldn't want to rest and, and enjoy the love and bliss of God. And it can be done if we follow that sacred formula that Guruji has given to us. Some of you will be familiar with this. He says, Kriya Yoga plus devotion. It works like mathematics. It cannot fail. And yet, while we all know this intellectually, we see how easily we are distracted by the things in this material world, making us forget our highest purpose, which is to find and know God in this life. And this is why the great ones tell us repeatedly, reminding us that this world is a cosmic dream. It is impermanent. It is an illusion created by the power of Maya. And that without remaining close to God, we forget our relationship with him. And I want to share a story with you that illustrates this point so beautifully. It's the story of Narad Muni. He's a godly sage who is a great devotee of Lord Krishna. And one day he was walking near, by a nearby village with Lord Krishna and he says, Krishna, could you please show me the power of your maya? I want to see her magic and how she acts. And Lord Krishna hesitates and uh, says, my dear Narad, are you sure you want me to show you the power of my maya? Yes, yes, Krishna, I want to see her power. Lord Krishna replies, very well then, but it's so hot, Narad. Could you please bring me a drink of water? Right away, Narad says, and he hits, sets off across the field. He approaches a nearby village, and when he comes to the first house, he knocks, and the door opens, and there stands the most beautiful young maiden he has ever seen. And she looks up at Narad and smiles, and he is dumbstruck by her beauty. Finally, he musters up the courage to say something, and he says, will you marry me? Now, that's the Indian way. At least it was in those days. And so soon the couple settle down, and children arrive, and the house is bustling with activity. And then years pass, and the children mature and marry, and now there's grandchildren. And Narada becomes the great patriarch of a large family, and he's respected by the entire village, and his lands stretch out to the horizon. One day, dark, ominous clouds form on the horizon, and then torrential rains descend on the village and causes the banks of the river to overflow, and it inundates the entire area. And Nara tries his mightiest to save his belongings and his family members, but the treacherous waters render him completely helpless. And everything that he loves and lives for perishes. He finds himself somehow on a mound of earth above the waters, and in utter grief he cries out, Krishna, Krishna. Lord, Lord, and in an instant, the entire area disappears. And they're standing on the field where they once walked together, what seemed like many years ago, is Lord Krishna who says, Nard, where is my drink of water? And weeping bitter tears, Nard cries, Lord, I've lost my entire family. And Krishna smiles and says, calm down, Narad. Tell me, where did your family come from? They came from me. I am the creator of all that is. I am the only reality that is eternal and unchanging. 
Everything else is a dream, an illusion, constantly slipping out of your grasp. This is the power of Maya. She overcomes us and we forget our Lord. And I think we all agree none of us escapes this. So that's an incredible illustration of what we are all exposed to, what we all go through in this life. Now in many places in his teachings, Guruji tells us that this world is a cosmic dream. And in his recorded talk, Awake in the Cosmic Dream, he shares with us what God was thinking when he created us and placed us in his dream world. God said, I was one, I wanted to be many. I was consciousness, but I wanted to be a dream. And I made many in my dreams and I play with them in my dreams. So in order for our souls to play in this dream, the veil of Maya must come over our consciousness. And then our very high soul vibration begins to diminish and descend so that we can immerse ourselves completely in this earthly drama. And then on top of that, we are endowed with egoity to create that strong sense of separation from God and attachment to the dream. And so now we are in dreamland, completely forgetting our connection to spirit as if we have amnesia. So God continues, when they get away from me, they suffer the nightmare of my dream. So in ego consciousness, we are in a state of mistaken identity. And we experience a very intense forgetfulness of who we truly are. And because we bought into this dream story, it now becomes our reality because we've taken it so seriously. And Mili Nimata tells us that when Guruji was dictating his commentary on the Bhagavad Gita, that for many days he was in the state of consciousness about how this world is a dream. And again and again he gave the analogy that it isn't real, that we should not take it so seriously. And on one occasion, he went into very deep meditation and he stayed there for some time. And when he opened his eyes, he began to laugh and laugh and laugh. Finally, one of the devotees said, Guruji, what are you laughing at? And Guruji said, oh, it is such a joke. It is such a joke the Divine Mother is playing on you all. You think this is so real? It is not real. It is not real. Don't take it so seriously. It is just a joke she's playing on you. Look to the Divine Mother. Look to the beam. That is your only haven of safety. So God continues, when they know I am the dreamer and it is my thought that dreams their existence, they no longer suffer. Then they play the divine play in my dream universe. So let's ask this question, what is the script for this play? What is God's divine plan? Guruji said, God is love. His plan for creation can be rooted only in love. Every saint who has penetrated to the core of reality has testified that a divine universal plan exists 
and that it is beautiful and full of joy. So let's think about this for a moment because it's so easy for us to say, well, <laughs> this dream that we're in, it's unfair. It's even pessimistic. Actually, it's not. Because in order for us to reunite with God, he has arranged the cosmic scheme to prevent us from ever being fulfilled by anything in this material world. And he explains to us why. He says, it is because we are divine. We are a part of him, that we are unable to find lasting satisfaction in anything material. He said, until you attain contentment in God, you will not win contentment from anything else. So finally, I think each one of us can acknowledge that we reach the point where we think, I'm not doing this anymore. It's futile. I cannot find contentment in anything. And when we reach that point, this is when our spiritual work begins. And that is to transcend the ego's hold and its strong sense of separation from God. And we've been shown how to do this. First and foremost, each and every day, to immerse ourselves in God's presence through prayer and meditation. And then immersed in his presence, there is no sense of separation. And then we've opened ourselves up to the inflow of his help, his blessings, and his guidance. And then anchored in him, we have him with us, we can face any challenge that besets us. So that instead of someone challenges us or someone tests us in some way, instead of reacting emotionally, we very wisely, we very calmly and peacefully and respectfully strive to resolve that challenge as harmoniously and as positively as we possibly can. This is how we win our battles, and this is how we rub off that ego. It's like sandpaper. Every time we behave rightly, it's like sandpaper rubbing off the ego's hold. So here's the plan. To so live our lives that they constantly revolve around our connection with spirit and to so train our minds so that they become like the needle of a compass. You know, no matter which way you turn a compass, that needle always points to that bright pole star of his presence. And then when we look to the beam, that divine light will illuminate our way and guide us. And our unwavering commitment to live this way is the highest and purest degree of devotion that we can offer to God. And when we have that, when we have God, we are unstoppable. Now there is one more divine aspect for us to fulfill in the divine plan, and it'll happen automatically. And that is by our own humble example of someone who truly loves God. We automatically influence those around us. We uplift them, we inspire them to want to do the same. And this is why Guruji taught us that beautiful universal prayer May thy love shine forever on the sanctuary of my devotion, and may I be able to awaken thy love in all hearts. Think about 
the deep meaning of that prayer the next time you offer it. In his autobiography of a yogi, Guruji shares a story with us, his experiences that he had with a beautiful saint, Master Mahashaya, whose life was thus anchored in the divine and who had a major influence on Guruji's life. And these are excerpts from autobiography. Guruji said, I saw and felt this love of God in the true masters I met in India. I remember when, as a young boy, I saw for the first time Master Mahashaya, a very great saint. He was meditating, gazing into space, into another world. He hadn't even spoken to me, but the instant I came into his presence, I was entranced. Because I knew there was something real in him. I saw that he was one with God. I started to speak to him, but he turned to me and said, Little sir, please be seated. I'm talking to my Divine Mother. When I heard these words, something happened within me. I realized I was standing before one who was actually communing with God. At that moment, the love I felt for Divine Mother was a thousand million times more than I had felt even for my earthly mother, the dearest person in the world to me. It was overwhelming. The consciousness of separation from my Divine Mother was an indescribable torture of the spirit. I fell moaning to the floor. Master Mahashaya's love and devotion for the Divine Mother had a soul-stirring impact on Guruji's life. And he tells us that Master Mahashaya was an incarnation of purity, the greatest man of humility that he had ever known. And he said that his humility sprang from a recognition of his total dependence on the Lord. It's so beautiful. Now that experience of Guruji's took place in the early 1900s. And in the year 2018, several of us, of us nuns went to India on spiritual pilgrimage and we visited Guruji's ashrams. And we also went to 50 Amherst Street, the home of Master Mahashaya. And as we entered those sacred rooms where those glorious meetings took place between the master and our guru, I perceived a little tiny glimpse of what Guruji experienced, if I may even say that. And I really struggle to find words to describe the experience. But when we entered the room, it was as if your consciousness was just swept up into a sacred presence that baptized you with a power and a love that you could hardly contain. And you knew you were in the presence of the Divine Mother of the Universe and her saintly son, Master Mahashaya. And in that sacred presence, it made you bow in utter reverence. It was a very moving experience. Guruji describes in great detail his experiences with a saint in his autobiography, and I would very much encourage you to read that chapter entitled The Blissful Devotee and His Cosmic Romance, because the relationship between God and our soul is a real love story. So now, let us explore the various ways that we too can nurture that same devotion for God. Guruji tells us that God is both form and formless, personal and impersonal, and that there is no limit to the ways in which we can approach God because he himself is limitless. 
sometimes devotees say, well, he appeared to Guruji so many times, can he appear to us? Absolutely. But Guruji says it depends upon the intensity of the love and devotion of your heart. So when practicing devotion, it's good to have a concept of God that you can relate to so that he becomes for you the most approachable, the most lovable being in the universe because he is. And most of us will gravitate toward form because the mind can easily grasp form. And that's good because when we pray, we can feel that we are directing our devotion and our love to that aspect of God and feel that we're nurturing and deepening that relationship with the divine. Now, one devotee said that when she was cultivating a personal relationship with Guru, she was, Guruji, she was also attracted to all the other gurus, and so she got a little confused. And another devotee said that she was raised in a very strong Christian background, and she felt that she was being disloyal to Christ because she was so drawn to Guruji and to this path. So I once asked Rinalini Ma, why are we drawn to different gurus at different times? And this was her answer. She said that most likely many of us have spent at least one lifetime or even multiple lifetimes with each one of the gurus and this is why they seem so familiar to us and why we are so drawn to them. And then she added, however, we have only one Sat Guru, one true Guru assigned to us by God. So it's really good to try to develop a deep connection with each one of the Gurus so that you can draw upon their essence. Each one of them manifests a certain spiritual quality. You know, and I can tell you what, sh what each one of the gurus manifests, but I think I'll let you explore and discover that for yourself. But as a young nun, I, I was a little confused myself, and I remember how much this beautiful prayer of Guruji's helped me when he prayed, Oh, Mother Divine, it is thou who has become Christ, Krishna, and the saints of all religions. So beautiful. So it's important to remember that they are all sons of God come back to earth to be our saviors. Now there's another point that I wanted to uh, explain a little bit on and that is sometimes you are focused on one of the gurus when in your meditation maybe another one of the gurus comes to the fore and uh, the reason for this is because there may be a need for divine intervention so it's important for us to understand that the gurus are constantly working for us and sometimes there is a need for them to come and intercede on our behalf. And this was the case with Mira Mataji, the mother of Sri Mrinalini Mataji. Whenever we celebrated the commemoration days of Lahiri Mahashaya, she would hold satsang with the nuns and she would speak of her great love and faith in Lahiri Mahashaya. And we could feel that because she made him so real. And she said that when she was very new on the path, and this was in the mid or late 1940s, she was very new on the path, and she was going through a health crisis. And the doctors told her she had to have a procedure done. And so when she said this to Guruji, she played it down and said, I really don't need the procedure, I'll be fine. So a few days later, Guruji spoke with her about it, and he told her that she should go through with the surgery. Now listen carefully what he said to her. 
that he had talked this situation over with Lahiri Mahashaya and that he said she should have the surgery, that he, Lahiri Mahashaya, would take responsibility for seeing her through it. Now you might remember in Autobiography of a Yogi, Guruji said about Lahiri Mahashaya that he was very much like Christ, that he was a great healer. And you may also remember that Lahiri Mahashaya left his body in the year 1893. And here in the late 1940s, Guruji was discussing the situation with him. And then Guruji told Mirama to do the following. He said, I want you now to begin to chant Om Guru Om Lahiri, Om Guru Om Lahiri, Om Guru Om Lahiri to begin to invoke the presence of the Guru and the presence of Lahiri Mahashaya to attune her consciousness to their divine presence and blessings. And she thought to herself, all right, I'll go through the procedure and I'll start chanting Om Guru Om Lahiri and I didn't even know who Lahiri was. But the point is, that the gurus do intercede for us when there is a need for divine intervention. And they've done this, I'm sure every one of us can testify to that, how many times one of the gurus has helped us in some way. And our part is to be receptive with full faith and to offer to them our undying love and gratitude. So now let's talk briefly about communing with our Creator in His impersonal aspect. And even when I say that, He's still very personal and He responds to our love and our human affection. And one devotee said to me that when she was a very young girl, whenever she closed her eyes, eyes she would see a very bright light here at the forehead. She said it filled her entire forehead. And she said she knew, somehow she knew, that that light lovingly guided her. And when she shared that with me, I, I thought it's so beautiful because you see that God will manifest himself in different ways at different times to let us know that he is near and that we matter to him because we are his child. And she said, I had no religious background whatsoever. That's a beautiful thought to hold. So you too may experience in your meditation a divine light here. Or maybe you will have a special blessing that uplifts you in meditation. Or you feel that you're becoming very calm, peaceful, anchored in God, centered, and then you approach life situations from that center with a very clear mind and a very clear heart. Or you may find that some troubling, limiting behavior is no longer there. It's gone. That is a blessing that comes from that impersonal aspect of God. He just wipes away those stumbling blocks. Or you may feel in the middle of the day this joy that bubbles up. You're very happy and you don't know why, but you're just inwardly so full of divine joy. And there will come a time when you may feel within you something very sacred that's growing and deepening. And you realize, this, this is what I am. This is what gives me life, what strengthens and sustains me, what inspires me to keep on keeping on. This is where I want to live every day in my soul. 
and every one of us who strives our utmost to live these teachings will have that experience. And then one day we too will be able to say with Guruji, that beautiful quote of his when he said, what is this life coursing in my veins? Could it be other than divine? So let's now explore how we can express unconditional love to God so that the relationship is simply you loving God and God loving you. Listen carefully to these words of Guruji. He said, you have to catch him in the net of your unconditional love. And I remember how many times our revered Sri Mrinalini Mataji would say that. You have to catch him in the net of your unconditional love. And then he tells us what love means. Love means craving for God. And he says that God loves, appreciates love more than devotion. God appreciates love more than devotion, because in devotion there's a sense of distance and awe between you and God. But in loving God, there is unity and at one moment you merge, your soul and God merge. So to love God unconditionally without any sense of expectation is the purest and highest expression of love and devotion you can offer to God. You simply love him without any sense of what are you going to give me in return? And I say this because sometimes devotees say, well, I've been meditating for many years and, or I've been having a long meditation and what am I, I didn't get anything. <laughs> When you approach your meditation with a sense of expectation, you're straining for results or tangible experiences. And then when those tangible experiences don't come, you think, well, I'm not gaining anything. So I would encourage you, don't measure, don't harbor any expectations. And you'll see that you're going to be able to meditate so much better because the mind is free from any unconscious or subconscious craving for results. And then when you meditate serenely and peacefully, you'll be able to perceive the responses, those subtle responses that God gives and he does give them all the time. Sri Yukteswarji said, to know God, don't expect anything. Just launch yourself with faith into his blissful presence within. And as you do this, you'll see that that also dissolves the whole of the ego because your mind is just focused on you only you, only you, my Lord, you're all that matters. You're the only reality. Nothing else is important. That's what it means to immerse yourself in the consciousness of God. And this is very important to understand because Guruji does say in his teachings that when you interiorize the consciousness very deeply, you can experience a state of samadhi, which is an expanded state of consciousness that comes, a blissful ecstasy of union with God. But then devotees say, when am I going to achieve this? So I want to share a story from Autobiography of a Yogi that will answer this question for us. It's the story of Guruji's meeting with Ram Gopal Mazumdar, the sleepless saint. And this is an excerpt. Guruji addressed the saint, 
Sir, why don't you grant me a samadhi? The saint replied, Dear one, I would be glad to convey the divine contact, but is not my place to do so. The saint looked at me with half-closed eyes. Your master will bestow that experience upon you shortly. Your body is not tuned just yet. As a small lamp bulb would be shattered by excessive electrical voltage, so your nerves are unready for the cosmic current. If I gave you the infinite ecstasy right now, you would burn as though every cell were on fire. Guruji explains, a master bestows the divine experience of cosmic consciousness when his disciple, by meditation, has strengthened his mind to a degree where the vast vistas would not overwhelm him. Mere intellectual willingness or open-mindedness is not enough. Only actual enlargement of consciousness by yoga practice and devotional bhakti can prepare one to absorb the liberating shock of omnipresence. So there's our answer. And let's be encouraged that with every effort we make, we are purifying the consciousness. We are expanding the consciousness and preparing it to receive. So we've covered the aspect of unconditional love for God. Let us now explore devotion, love and surrender to the Guru, which is called Guru Bhakti. Sister Kyanamata, who is a perfect example of Guru Bhakti said, glory to him who permits me to call him my Guru, without whom I could not possibly succeed in this work and with whom I cannot possibly fail. So devotion, surrender, and love for the Guru is important because he is the supreme gift given to us by God to lead us to that ultimate salvation and soul liberation. And when the Guru lovingly receives us as his disciple, he promises to guide and protect us in life and beyond until we attain that final state of liberation. And Paramahansa Ji described his own feelings when his master gave him that sacred promise. He said, a lifelong shadow lifted from my heart. The vague search hither and yon was over. I had found eternal shelter in a true guru. So guru bhakti means with childlike innocence, with full faith and sincerity, we devote ourselves completely to following him and his instructions lamb-like. And don't be confused when I use the word lamb-like because it takes tremendous willpower, commitment, and self-discipline to follow the Guru's teachings. But we do so because he is love and wisdom personified. And he sees the whole spectrum of our life. And he sees all those samskars, those past life tendencies that have shaped us in this life. And he knows exactly how to help us navigate through our karma and through those tendencies. And what he gives to us is tailor-made because he knows exactly what we need to reach salvation. And when we are receptive to the Guru's blessing and guidance, he imparts to us a portion of his divine consciousness, as much as we can receive at that moment. And when we are deeply in tune, 
he transmits to us the light of God to awaken our intuition that we may guide our lives wisely and make the right choices that lead us back to God. And this is why he's called the dispeller of darkness. And when he observes some flaw in our nature, he doesn't condemn us. Rather, he's infinitely patient and compassionate, showering his blessings and grace over our soul path to help us in every way. And I remember as a young devotee a time when I felt that inwardly Guruji was prompting me to overcome a certain flaw in my nature. And it was unmistakable because I sensed this powerful presence repeatedly conveying that message to me. There wasn't any escaping it. And while I knew that Guruji meant business, I also felt so much love that I wanted with all my heart to make that change. At the same time, I experienced fear, the fear of failure and some sadness that I might disappoint God and Guru. And I expressed that inwardly as I prayed. And I can't tell you what happened in an instant. It, I felt, <laughs> I heard these words reverberating in my consciousness. I will help you. It was the most sacred moment, I think, of my life because I realized that the Guru was there and that he understood everything I felt and everything that I was going through and that he was going to fulfill his promise to help me overcome all obstacles of delusion. And I share this with you so that you can see how he is and how he loves us and lets us know that we're cared for and loved every step of the way. I'd like to close now by sharing an account that illustrates that intimate bond that exists between guru and disciple it is the relationship that a blessed householder saint, Sri Bhupendranath Sanyal, shared with his guru, the great Yogavtar Lardi Mashai. Bhupendranath Sanyal shared this with Dayamataji and her party when they met him in India. He said that when he was 16 years old, he longed to go to Banaras, where his guru was. But being unable to go, he prayed deeply to the master for spiritual instruction. Lahiri Mahashaya appeared before him in a dream and gave him diksha, initiation. Later, when the boy finally went to Banaras and asked the guru for diksha, he said, Lahiri Mahashaya appeared to him and said, I've already initiated you in a dream. Three years later, this happened to him. I was 19 years old when Lahiri Mahashaya left his body. For a time, I was inconsolable. I slept but seldom, and I wept all the time. I couldn't eat or work. One night, I was weeping, and I fell asleep while doing so. Suddenly, I woke up to find Lahiri Mahashaya in front of me looking just as he had while he was in the flesh. At first, I couldn't realize it was he in flesh and blood. I thought it was a vision. But when Lahiri Mahashaya began to speak to me, I realized it was really he in the flesh. He asked, Why are you weeping? I said, How can I live when you are no more with me? He replied, who said I have left you? Am I not present before you now? And listen to what else he said. You live not only in this world. You are also with me. 
Lahiri Mahashaya smiled and said, Why have you imagined I was not here? I'm always with you. I'm here now with you. You need not be afraid. Then I laughed, realizing how foolish I had been. And as soon as I laughed, Lahiri Mahashaya laughed and all sorrow left me. He spoke of other things and then he said, when there is any necessity for me to come, I will come. Don't feel sad, for I am always with you. I touched his body and then he disappeared. After Sanyal Mahashaya shared this account with Dayamataji, she addressed the saint. We learn this from our guru, that you can judge a disciple by his feeling toward his own guru. To see your love and devotion for Lahiri Mahashaya is deeply touching to our hearts. Sanyal Mahashaya replied, my guru is my father, my God. I like to see him as my God. Never have I met another so great as he. Meeting him once, one could never forget him. Later, Dayamataji wrote, In Sanyal Mahashaya, we have seen the perfect attitude of a disciple toward his guru. For him, the guru is everything. He himself is nothing. For him, the guru is the shining light. He is but the bulb reflecting that light. For the, him, the guru is all wisdom. He is merely the conveyor of that wisdom. For him the Guru is love and bliss divine, and his eyes reflect that divinity that is his Guru. How much I admire such devotees, such selfless disciples, for indeed in the West and in the East they are few and far between. And I would like to share something with you. Perhaps some of you are aware of this beautiful little book entitled Visiting the Saints of India with Sri Dayamataji. And inside, on page 72, are those words of Sri Dayamataji that I just shared with you. And on this page is the saint, Sanyal Mahashaya, with Sri Dayamata sitting at his feet. If you don't have a copy of this book, I highly encourage you to attain a copy because it is such a beautiful book on devotion. So in closing, I want to share these words of Merlini Mata. Between disciple and guru, no separation exists. Whether the guru is in physical form or has left this earth, to dwell in an astral or causal realm or in the spirit beyond, he is ever near the disciple who is in tune. The consciousness of the true Guru is eternal, ever wakeful, ever attuned, uninterrupted by the opening and closing doors of life and death. His awareness of the disciple and his link with him are constant. So now, I would like to invite you to join me in a guided meditation for just a few minutes. Let us now prepare the consciousness to offer to God the love and devotion of our hearts. So let us place the attention at the point between the eyebrows. And each one of us, let's visualize there that aspect of the divine that is near and dear to our hearts. And with the attention on that divine one, feel that sacred presence and let us open our hearts and feel, 
Feel love, feel devotion, sweetly welling up in your heart. Feel it, for it is there naturally. Now feel your heart's love merging with that divine one. And know that your love is being lovingly received and that your entire being is in the embrace of that divine beloved of our souls. Now let us pray together, repeating after me, Beloved God, you have many devotees, but I have only you. You are all I have. Bless me with that single-hearted devotion that I may remain ever at thy feet. Bless me that I may always think of thee with a supreme love in my heart. For loving thee, I am lost in thy blessed presence. Engrossed in thy presence, there is no separation from thee. Engrossed in thy presence, there is no separation from thee. For thou and I are never apart. Thou and I are never apart. For thou and I are one. Thou and I are one. I am thine, thou art mine. I am thine, thou art mine, ever mine. Let us pray together. Father, mother, friend, beloved God, G 
Jesus Christ, Bhagavan Krishna, Mahavtar Babaji, Lardi Mashai, Swami Sri Yukteswarji, Divine Gurudev, Paramahansa Yoganandaji, Saints of all religions, we bow to you all. May thy love shine forever on the sanctuary of my devotion, and may I be able to awaken thy love in all hearts. Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. Amen. May God and the Gurus bless us all. Jai Guru.